Hello, I'm Will. This is Mike. We're the Tabletop Donkeys. Hello. And today we're bringing you issue 65 of Warhammer Age of Sigmar Mortal Realms magazine. Now, this issue came with two paints, Corax White and Nihilac Oxide. Uh, and as always, if you would like to skip straight to the battle report, you can do that using a time code in the description or using the chapter bars. But we'll have a look through the issue first. So first we have background on the Stormcast Eternal's Lords Veritant. These individuals are tasked with hunting down chaos in Sigmar's domains. It includes cults and other gatherings of chaos worshippers that still exist secretly in the areas that Sigmar's forces have conquered. And there's a picture of one there showing his equipment, uh, including his lantern, which allows him to uh, turn aside enemy magic. And they're also often accompanied by griff hounds that help them sniff out danger. Then we have information on the Exemplar Chambers of the Stormcast Eternals, some of the most elite and heroic formations of the Stormcast Eternals that are used as shock troops, and they consist mostly of warriors from the Paladin Conclaves, Retributors and Decimators and so on. As an organisation chart here, they're led by Lord Celestant and supported by various officers, and they include mostly Paladins, but also Prosecutors and Judicators. Then we have more of the history of the Prime Innerlands in Shaiish. Uh, this is the dawning of the Age of Sigmar, so when Sigmar sends the Stormcast Eternals to begin reclaiming the realms from the forces of chaos. And despite their antagonism, he seeks to form an alliance with Nagash, knowing that his help will be necessary to defeat chaos, but without success. And eventually, Nagash's forces do not turn up during the Battle of Gothizar, which remains in chaos hands as a result. And then it moves on to Nagash's great ritual to bind death magic to his pyramid, which causes the necroquake and creates the Shaish Nadir, a big vortex of death magic that draws everything towards itself, causing great misery for the remaining inhabitants of Shaish. Then we have background on Grimnir, the Duardin god of battle. Like his brother Grungni, he's one of the ancient gods of the Duardin, but during the Age of Myth, he fought with the god beast Volcatrix, the mother of Salamanders, and they mutually destroyed one another in the process, creating the material known as Urgold. And then some more information on the Fire Slayers who worship Grimnir and use Urgold to forge into runes that give them great power. And then it also mentions Magmadroths, which are the descendants of Volcatrix that the Fire Slayers sometimes ride into battle. Then we have a painting guide, adding more details to our Sigmarite mausoleum. First it suggests shading all the metal areas with Nolan oil to make them look weathered, and then to paint the rooftops first with Corax White, and then three coats of Nihilac Oxide to give them a turquoise verdigris. And over the Patreon, it teaches us how to use stippling as a technique. So this is a bit like dry brushing. You get a bit of paint on the brush and then wipe most of it off on tissue. But then you use a stabbing motion with the brush to just dab off a little bit of paint, which gives it a patchy, scratched finish, as you can see in these pictures. It suggests highlighting the flowers and dry brushing the skulls. And then some guidance on weathering effects. First of all, thinning down Mornfang Brown with a lot of water, a lot more than you'd normally use, and then painting it into the recesses where dirt would normally collect. And then doing the same thing with Troll Slayer Orange for areas which might be rusty, painting this where rust would naturally accumulate. And then also you can use Nihilac Oxide on bronze, brass coloured areas, again to make these areas look corroded by the environment. And there's the finished piece there with all that applied. And this issue also came with a fold-out insert entitled Carrion Empire. This is about the realm of Metallurgica in the realm of metal. It used to be a great empire full of wondrous artefacts and craftsmen, but during the Age of Chaos it was overrun by Nagash's forces and uh, its inhabitants were transformed into the deranged creatures of the Flesh Eater Corps. But during the Age of Sigmar it was attacked by the Skaven, who were trying to obtain its treasures for themselves. We've got a bit about Theodore Durenstein, the last king of Metallurgica, who still believes himself to be a noble ruler, but is in fact a deranged monster, and Warlock Bombardier Skatchnik of the clan's Scryer, who led the Spitzkaven expedition looking for artefacts. On the other side, there's more about the curse of the Flesh Eater Corpse, who believe themselves to be noble creatures, but are in fact cannibalistic monsters hungry for flesh, and the Skaven of the clan's Scryer, who are the inventors of the Skaven, who create all sorts of bizarre and dangerous war machines. And there's a showcase of some miniatures here. On the left, there's various Flesh Eater Corpse, and on the other side, some of the Skaven inventions. That's it for the contents of this issue, so now we'll be on to our game and we'll be learning a few new rules. So as is often the case, we have some new rules to learn before we can get into our game for this issue. First up we have the Realm Rules for the Realm of Fire Axe So we have the Realm Sphere Magic and the Realm Command Abilities. Uh, the Realm Sphere Magic is the Fireball spell, which has a casting value of 5, and if it's successfully cast, you pick an enemy unit within 18 inches of the caster, and that they can see. And then that unit suffers a number of mortal wounds, uh, depending on the number of models in the unit. So if it's a single model, it only takes 1, and if it has 2 to 9, it takes D3, and if it has 10 or more, it takes D6. 
and the Realm Command ability. It's called Blazing Fervor. You use it at the start of your hero phase and you pick a friendly unit holding within 12 of the hero using it. And that unit can add one to run and charge rolls until your next hero phase. But you can only use that command ability on the same unit once. And on the other side we have tutorials on how they're used, which are fairly self-explanatory. And then we have the Realm Sphere feature, which is called Burning Lands, which gives every terrain piece the Volcanic Rule, which is at the start of each hero phase you roll a dice for each Volcanic Terrain feature, and then on the six each unit within an inch of that terrain feature so it's D3 Mortal Wounds. And it also says that this applies to the Sigmarite Ruins and the uh, Mausoleum. So the Sigmarite Ruins already are haunted, so they're also volcanic as well, so they're doubly dangerous. And then the Sigmarite Mausoleum, it's not clear how volcanic interacts with the Garrison rule, uh, but we're going to say that if you're Garrison, you still have to roll for volcanic, because presumably it's all very hot, not just uh, the outside of it. And there's an example of it being used there, for what cases people would have to take wounds. And then we can get on to some more backgrounds on the lead up to, for this battle. Some great magic has awoken on Akshi and is causing the land itself to change and writhe. And uh, obviously the Stormcast and the Nighthorns are still fighting amongst each other. Trying to make advantage of this where in this little short story here, a Stormcast is able to tackle a Knight of Shrouds into some magma, killing them both. And then we have the uh, lay of the land here in the battlefront. Um, so some Stormcast fighting against Spiderfang Grotz, which we uh, learnt about Grotz fairly recently. A Lord Veritant encountering a cultist of Zinch. And down here, possibly the source of this uh, great magic disturbance, the Nighthaunt have stumbled across a Stormbolt and have uh, accidentally opened it and released whatever was within. And uh, here we have the uh, forces, which I think are pretty much similar to the previous issue. I'm not going to go over them individually. We can finally get into our battle plan, Trial by Fire, where the uh, Stormcast and Nighthorn are fighting over a particularly contested front, even amidst the rising temperatures. So you can see we're actually using all four of the battle maps we have now. So this will be the biggest battle we would ever fought on. We have three objectives across the middle. So there's one in the centre and the other two are 18 inches either side, and then both sides have a nine inch territory along the long edge. And we're also going to be setting up four terrain pieces of our choice, and we're using the Realm of Fire rules, as obviously. And this game is uh, based on victory points, so you gain a victory point at the end of each of your turns for each objective you control, and then you get an extra victory point if your opponent controls that objective at the start of the turn. Uh, the Night Horned player deploys first, and we choose two hero choices and six troops choices each. And uh, as always, units with a star count as two choices. And also, I won the last game, so I'll be getting a triumph as well. So we'll go into the armies we picked, and then get the game set up. First up, we have the Stormcast Army Wills picked. Yep, so for my two hero choices, we've gone for a Knight Encantor, the Zandra Azubolt in this case, and the Knight Azeros. Zandra Azubolt will be my general. She'll have the Inspiring Command trait, which is the one that means friendly order units but within six inches don't have to take Battleshock tests. The Knight Azeros will have the Relic Blade Artifact of Power, which gives him plus one damage. Then to accompany them, we've got three Retributors, two units of five Liberators, because I need the bodies and I don't get Sequitors in this game for some reason. Five Judicators, for a similar reason, also because they've got a long range, and two Evocators on Celestial Draclines because they're quite fast and it gives them a chance to redeem themselves after their previous showing. And here's the Nighthawk army I've picked. So uh, for my two heroes, I have the dream team of a Spirit Torment and a Guardian of Souls. Uh, the Spirit Torment will be my general, and he'll have the uh, Ruler of the Night command trait, so his uh, range for deathless minions is 12 inches rather than 6. And the Guardian of Souls, I'm going to give the uh, Cloak of Mist and Shadows, because that extra move is going to be pretty handy, I think. And then for my troops choices, I have a unit of 5 Blade Geists, a unit of 5 Harridans, a unit of 5 Hex Wraiths, a unit of 3 Spirit Hosts, the 2 Chain Ghasts, and uh, since we haven't seen them in a very long time, the four Mymorn Banshees, I think having an extra deny from the Banshees would come in pretty handy. So we have our board set up and the army's deployed, and I actually have to stand up to uh, see most of it because it just about covers the entire table we have. So you can see we have the uh, Stormbot up there in the top left. Uh, we counted all the ruins as a single piece, just to have a bit more terrain. So we have that down here near the Nighthorn to the zone, the uh, Fallen Ruins, and then the Fallen Head on the bottom right. And the three objectives across the middle. I go over the Nighthawk deployment, I have the Hex Race, the Guardian of Souls, and the Paradons on my left flank. Got the Chain Ghasts here in the middle, the Spirit Hosts and the Mimon Banshees with the Spirit Torment, and then the uh, Lady Geist Revenants over there on my right flank. Now we can see the Stormcast deployment. So left to right as you see it, we've got the two Evocators on Draclines, a unit of five Liberators, Retributors right in the middle, another unit of five Liberators with Zandria as you roll behind them, the Knight Encantor, and then the five Judicators and the Knight Azeros out on my other flank. So now we're rolling off to see you guys first. Uh, I rolled for my Triumph off camera and I got the uh, one that lets me re-roll hits once again. And the Stormcast finished deploying first, so they win if it's a tie. 
Oh, well, I won anyway. Yeah. And I'm going to go first because I want to take the objectives and get some early victory points because if the Night won't do, I won't be able to shift them off. So we're heading into Stormcast turn one. So in the Hero Phase, I gain a command point. We're not in range to do Arcane Bolt or the new Fireball spell. So we're just going to try and cast Mystic Shield with Zandra Azure in six, getting a seven. No, you might try and cast in power. You can have Mystic Shield. I'm going to put that on the Evocators on Dracolines, and then they themselves will try and cast in power, needing a six, getting five. So no. So my entire battle line has moved up, and we've taken all three objectives. All the infantry ran, the Judicators didn't run, but they're now in range. Yeah, the Knight Azeroth moved up to take the objective out on the far flank, but that's it for movement, on to the shooting phase. Yeah. The Judicators are going to fire at the Myrmore Banshees, do the Shock Bolt Bow first. So it hits on a three, no, it missed. Then we've got the other four shots, hitting on threes, or the Prime hits on a two. Oh, they all hit. Wounding on threes, three wounds. Three, four plus saves for the Banshees. Oh, save two. So one takes the damage. Ignore it on a six. No. So one Banshee is killed. And I'll take away this one on the end. But that'll be it for my turn. There's nothing else I can do. And at the end of the turn, I score three victory points for holding all three objectives. And then we'll be on to the Nighthorn turn. In my hero phase, I gain a command point. And then uh, the Guardian of Souls is going to try and cast Spectral Lure. He needs a six. He gets it with a nine. I suppose I'll try and unbind with one of my users to the minute. Oh, 12. Oh, there you go. So the Hex Race and the Chain Gas moved up normally. Actually, so did the Guardian of Souls, but that's where I wanted to be. And everyone else ran. So effectively, the Hex Race have got five morals on that objective. And over here in the middle, there are three Spirit Hosts and two Banshees on the objective. And then over here, the Blade Geist also ran, and two of them are on the objective. So they take it from the Knight Azeroth. Something I don't get to do very often, I have a shooting phase where the two chain gas are in range of that unit of liberators there in the middle, so they're going to shoot at them. They've got a D3 shots each with their gassed flails for four. These are hitting on fours and re-rolling ones because of the spirit torment. Ooh, they all hit. Wounding on twos because of the guardian of souls. Ooh, three wounds. So three six plus saves, re-rolling ones for liberators. Oh, no, fail all of them. That's three damage. So uh, we'll lose this liberator who's not in range of the objective and put a wound on there. This one on this end. And then at the end of the turn I capture all three objectives. So I get three victory points for holding three objectives and another three victory points for taking them from the Stormcast at the end of a battle round one. So I'm up to six and the Stormcast are on three. And rolling off for battle round two. Oh. I win the roll off. So I think I'm going to go first. So I'll head into Nighthaunt turn two. Well, my hero phase go up to two command points and then the Guardian of Souls is going to try and cast Fireball. He needs a five. He gets it with a six. I'll try and unbind with the Evocators, I suppose. Why not? Needing a seven? Nope. I'm going to pick this unit of Liberators as the target. So they have five models, so they'll take D3 mortal wounds. And they take two. So that's a dead Liberator. Uh, we'll use, lose this one who will be useless in a fight if that comes to that. So also in my hero phase, I did move the Spirit Hosts in range of the Volcanic Terrain here to get them in range of the objective. So uh, I do need to see if they take any mortal wounds. And they do not. Uh, they need to roll a six. We'll start over on the left flank for the moon phase. The Hex Race and the Harridans and the Guardian of Souls will all moved up normally. And over here in the middle, the Chain Gars have moved over the ruins so that with the Spirit Torment there, the Hex Race should be able to stay poorly within 12 of them to get the reroll hits. The Spirit Hosts have moved up normally. Then over here on the right, the Blade Guys are just going to shuffle a bit so that they're all within six of the objective. Then in the shooting phase, the Chain Gas are going to shoot at the uh, unit of Liberators they shot at last turn. 2d3 shots, 5 this time, hitting on 4s, rerolling 1s, reroll that 1, 3 hits this time, no, not that, it was a 3, wounding on 2s again, ooh, only getting 1. So only 1 6 plus save, rerolling 1s, no, failed. Uh, that's enough to fail, finish off the wounded liberator. Then we're on to the charge phase, I'll start off with the Harridans first, they're going to declare a charge. I'm going to spend a command point to use the um, Realm command ability to get plus one to their roll. Uh, Blazing Fury, I think it's called. And they need to roll. Oh, yeah. So uh, this should have been done in the hero phase, but I would have done it. So Will's going to let me do that since it's the first time I'm using it. But well, they rolled a seven, which is enough to get them to where I want them to go. So it's actually an eight. So the Harridans will charge into the Evocators, and the Hex Race will charge as well. They're only needing a th well, three is the minimum, so they're in. And then over here, the Spirit Host will charge. Uh, probably need... Oh, nine is definitely enough. So the Spirit Host will charge into the middle of all the Stormcasts like that, tying up the Judicators as well. And that's all my charges. So we'll be on to the combat phase. At the start of the combat phase, the uh, Guardian of Souls will use his free move from the Cloak of Mists and Shadows to just move a bit closer. Should be able to get all the Harrodons into combat and within his aura range now. 
So I get to pick first, and I'm going to pick the Harrigans to go first. And I'll also use my Triumph on the Harrigans, so that they're going to be re-rolling hits. Because they don't get any uh, re-roll abilities where they're going to be. So the Harrigans can all pile in, so they're all in range. So we have 16 attacks for the Harridans, uh, 3 base, the Slasher Crone. Hitting on 4s, rerolling everything because I'm using my Triumph. So that's 9 hits before the rerolls. Rerolling the 7 misses. Oh, getting another 6, so that's 15 hits. And these wound on 2s thanks to the Guardian of Souls. And because these are still the old edition Harridans, uh, any 6s rolled are 2 damage instead of 1. 12 wounds and three sixes in there. I'll roll the two damaged ones first. We've got a five plus save because of the rend. Get re rolling ones because of Mystic Shield though. No, it's still a failure. So four damage so far. And all the rest on fives re rolling ones. Oh, no ones. And made another four. So that's another, that's a nine total damage. So the, basically one is left on one wound. So the normal Evocator will die and the Prime has got one wound remaining. I'm going to do Zandra Azubolt before she gets attacked by Spirit Host. She'll pile in just into there. She has three attacks hitting on threes, two hits, uh, wounding on threes, two wounds. Two four plus saves, the spirit hosts made both. So it's my pick next, and I'm going to pick the hex race to go, because I think they're slightly more likely to get killed than spirit hosts. So the hex race have piled in, and uh, we managed to just about fit a fourth one in there, and still stay within 12 inches of the chain ghasts. And this guy in the end is just about within an inch of the Evocator Prime, so he's going to attack the Prime, and then the other three, including the Hell Wraith, are going to attack the Liberators. So I'll do the lone regular Hex Wraith attacking the Prime. He hits on four of your only ones and sixes do a mortal wound. He rerolls that one into a miss. So he only hits once with his size. He wounds on a two. It does. And the Ren minus one. Five plus save, we're rolling ones. Ah, oh, he's dead. There you go. And that's enough to finish off the Evocators and Draculines. And then attacking the Liberators. There are seven attacks from size. Two each plus seven. Um, remember the Hell Wraith gets an extra one. And again, these hit on fours of your only ones and sixes do mortal wounds. No sixes so far. Oh, there's a six. Three regular hits. That also wound on twos. Gaining three wounds. Uh, also five plus saves. Rolling ones. Oh, made two and failed one. So it's actually only two damage. Yeah. And then we've got six attacks from horses. Hitting on fours. You're only ones. Oof. Oh, <laughs> tired old horses. Only one hit. Wounds on a four. It doesn't. So two damage will kill this liberator. Uh, I'll do the other unit of Liberators before they get attacked by the Spirit Hosts. Then I'll pile in a little bit. They have seven attacks hitting on fours. Get them all in the box. Oh, we've got five hits. And wounding on threes. Oh, two. Two four plus saves for Spirit Hosts. We fell both, but they are in range for Deathless Minions because of the improved range from the uh, Spirit Torment. But nope, that's two damage to the Spirit Host. And then the Spirit Host on my last unit, so they get to go. Uh, the two that are in range of Zondra will fight her. The other one will attack the Liberators. So, 12 attacks on Zandria, uh, hit it on 5s, we're rolling 1s, 6s do mortal wounds. Well, there's 3 6s so far, and 1 normal hit, Rerolling rolling the 1s. Yeah, nothing. And the normal hit, wounds on a 4, it does. So I get 1 3 plus save, which I made, so I just take 3 mortal wounds. Yeah, she's down to 2. It's just my units to fight, I'll do the Judicators then. So the Judicators will pile in, bringing themselves a little bit closer to the objective, and we can get 4 in range of the Spirit Hosts. 4 attacks hitting on 3s, getting 4. Wounding on fours. Two. Two four plus saves. Fell both again. Six to ignore. No. So two damage to the Spirit House. That one will get killed, and then the other one will take a wound. Just these Liberators left to go, and they won't pile in much, just a tiny bit, and then they fight the uh, Hex Race. Seven attacks, hitting on fours. Oh, six hits. Wounding on threes. Four wounds. Four plus saves. Made three. Well, I'll put it on the guy on the back who's unengaged, but he is within six of the Guardian of Souls. Oh, well, even he ignored it. So no damage at all. Well, in the battle rock phase, I killed a number of Stormcasts this turn, more than three, so I'm going to bring that Banshee that died back. Fortunately, I wasn't in range of the Spirit Host. The Spirit Torrent wasn't close enough. And then this Liberator unit over here has to take a battle rock test because they lost two men this turn. Six will be bad, but I get to reroll if I fail, which I didn't anyway. Yeah, and I still hold all three objectives, so I get three more victory points and go up to nine, and we'll head into Stormcast turn two. Well, in the hero phase, I get another command point, and then I'll try and cast Spirit Storm with Zandria. She needs a seven. Gets it with an eight. I'm going to try and unbind with the Mind War Banshees. I'm getting a nine. Ooh, only getting a seven, so it does go off. Yeah, everything's in range, so Spirit Torment gets to try and ignore that damage. Nope. The Banshee? Nope. This Spirit Host? Nope. Harridans ignore a six? Nope. Hex Race? Yes. 
Blade Geists? No. Chain Geists? Yes. Guardian of Souls? Yes. So it's going to do a mortal wound to the Spirit Host and kill a Banshee, so I'll take this one away. The Spirit Torment's down to four. That Haradon will go. This Blade Geist on the end will go as well. We're in the movement phase. The Knight Azeroth has flown across the ruins. He might take mortal wounds for doing so, but he needs to get himself into the action. And the Zandra Antipop has retreated from combat with the Spirit Hosts, but the Judicators and Liberators will stay there. On the other side, the Retributors have moved out a little bit into the centre, and the three Liberators have retreated to make sure that they survive a bit longer. Well, for the Knight Azeroth, so this is the um, haunted feature that this terrain always comes with, rather than the Volcanic. So it's at the end of the movement phase, and it's if he rolls a 1, he takes three mortal wounds, which he does not. Then we'll be on to the shooting phase, where the Judicators have to shoot at the Spirit Hosts. So the Shockbolt Bow hits on a 3, it hits, it turns into D6 hits for 5, and we'll roll the other hits as well. Uh, we've got one miss out of all of that. Eight hits winning on threes. Uh, three. Four plus save for spirit hosts. Failed two. Uh, ignore damage on six. No. So remaining spirit host is down to two wounds. Then we'll be on to the charge phase. The Knight Azeroth will declare a charge. Only needs about three to get to the spirit hosts, but a bigger number would be nice. Oh, at 11. Uh, he'll come all the way to there with that roll. So he's within half an inch of the Marmor Banshees, but outside of three inches of the spirit torment, which is important. Then the Retributors will declare a charge as well. Their charge roll will be a four, which is all they needed. And they will use that four inches to get themselves there into contact with the Hex Wraiths. Now at the start of the combat phase, the Guardian of Souls will shift a bit, just so the Retributor on the end there can't pile in and uh, attack him. But then I'll pick the Retributors to fight first and they will pile in. They've piled in a little bit, and then they put all their attacks on the Hex Wraiths. Seven attacks hitting on threes, sixes do two mortal wounds. We've got four mortal wounds and one other hit. Mm. Normal hit wounds on a three, it does. So I'll do a save for the normal hit, failed. And then sixes ignore damage. Oh, we ignored three, so only one will die and another will take a damage. So I'll take him off and then put a wound on this chap at the back. And then I'm gonna pick the Banshees to go. So they're just gonna pile in to get them all in. Only one attack each, so three attacks hitting on fours, we're rolling ones. Oh, we roll that one. Oh, getting three hits. Wounding on threes. Two wounds, minus two rend. Five plus saves, fail both. 2d3 damage. So if I roll well, which I did, he takes five damage. And that's actually enough to kill him. I'll do the Liberators fighting the Spirit Host. Can only get two of them in because they block each other's way. Five attacks hitting on three, uh, fours, three hits. Wounding on threes, two wounds. Two four plus saves, made one. Ignore that on a six, nope. Well, the single remaining spirit host will go next, and he'll attack the Judicators, because he might kill one of them. So yeah, six attacks, hitting on fives, re-rolling one. Sixes do mortal wounds. Well, there's two mortal wounds. And re-roll that one, into a miss. So just two mortal wounds. And uh, we'll lose this Judicator, because he's the furthest from the objective. Well, and then the Judicators get to go. They'll just pile in like this to get all of them able to strike. Four melee attacks, hitting on threes. You need two. Winning on fours, one. Four plus save, made it. Finally, my hex race get to go. So the hex race will pile in such that they can all fight. Um, nine scythe attacks, hitting on fours, re-rolling ones, and sixes do more wounds. Oh, it wasn't in the box here, so I'll re-roll that one with it. Oh, that's two misses. So we only got four hits. Four hits, wounding on twos, getting three. Three five plus saves, made two. So only only one wound. Eight attacks from horses, hitting on fours, you're running ones. Well, they did better than last time. Uh, as usual, actually, they do better than the riders. Five hits, wounding on fours, two wounds. Two four plus saves. Made one fair one. Right. So this retributor takes two wounds and goes down to one. And that's going to be it, I think. No bad shot test to make. I only killed two, so I can't bring any models back. So after some careful measurement in the middle, we determined that in fact only three Stormcasts are on the objective, so the Stormcasts do not get to take that objective and stay on three victory points. And that'll be it for battle round two. So we're rolling off for battle round three. Oh, I won, and I'm gonna go first. Well, I gained a command point in the hero phase, and uh, now we're gonna try and do Spirit Storm. Needing a seven to cast, getting a nine. Well, we're gonna try and bind that with the Banshees again, see if they can get extra attacks. Needing a 10, no. Everything except the Blade Geist is in range. So I'll start with the Harridans, don't ignore damage. Hex Race, don't. Guardian Souls, doesn't. Chain Gas, nope. Banshees, nope. Spirit Torment, yes. Uh, the remaining Spirit Host, yes. 
Uh, then Zandru has moved across towards the uh, objective on the left-hand side of the board. The Liberators over here have rearranged themselves a bit, and then there's no more movement. Everyone else will stay in melee. So, shooting phase. Where the Judicators have to shoot the Spirit Host. Uh, the shot ball bow hits on a three. It does. It does d6 hits. Four. And then I'll roll the other hits to hit. We've got two hits out of that, so six total. Wounding on threes. Five wounds. Five four plus saves. Oh, one fail. If I roll a six. No, he Phew. finally dies. <laughs> and with that, the last spirit host is killed. On to the charge phase. We'll do Zandra Rajabot first, because she's the important one. Her charge roll is a seven. She'll just go there. I contemplated using her spirit flasks, but uh, she, you know, with that roll, she can't get in the right place. So she'll just attack normally, I suppose. Uh, then we'll charge with these liberators. Oh, they get a ten. Um, with that mighty roll, they'll charge all the way through this gap here, and they stay three inches away from the Harridans. Then these other Liberators will charge, because they've now been freed up thanks to the death of the Spirit Host. And their roll is an 8. And they'll finish their charge like that, uh, getting into contact with the Mimor Banshees, but staying away 3 inches of the Spirit Torment. Then we'll be on to the combat phase. I will not blow up any Spirit Flasks, because I will hurt my own Retributors if I do that. Yeah, and the uh, Guiding of Sword is going to stay in melee, I think, because he probably needs to try and kill some things. We'll do uh, the Retributors first, because I think they've got the highest damage potential. They'll pile in a little bit, just bring an extra model in range of the objective, and then all the attacks go on the hex race. Seven attacks, hitting on three, six has caused two mortal wounds. We've got Oof. six mortal wounds and uh, another two hits. Yeah. Normal hits wound on threes, one of them does. So a four plus save, which is made, and then some uh, chances to ignore on a sixes. I ignored one, so the Hellwraith will live. So the Hellwraith will survive on one wound. I might pick the Mimor Banshees to go, because they might be able to kill some of those liberators. Uh, not going to pile in. Two attacks hitting on fours with ones. Two hits. Wounding on threes. One wound. Six to save, re-rolling ones. Oh, I saved it. Hey. I'm going to pick these three Liberators next, and they're going to actually pile in and attack the Guardian of Souls, who's now become a viable target. Okay. So they pile in like that. And then they have seven attacks, which hit on threes, because he has five or more wounds. So that makes a difference. We've only got two misses, but... Wounding on threes. Four wounds. Four, four plus saves. Two so far. Made three. Ignore damage on a six. Yes. I'll pick the Hellwraith to go next. Yeah, so the Hellwraith can slide towards the objective and still be in base contact with both Zandra and the Retributor. And he's going to put his attacks on Zandra and see if he can finish her off. So we have three attacks hitting on fours. Rerunning one. Sixes do mortal wounds. <laughs> Two mortal wounds. Zandra goes down. Well, then we've just got these three remaining Liberators. They won't pile in, so they just get to attack the Mimor Banshees. Seven attacks hitting on fours, five hits. And winning on threes, two wounds. Two four plus saves, fail both. More damage on a six, no. Oh, that's nice. the last of the Banshees. And finally the Guardian of Souls gets to go, I think. So we have three attacks from the Guardian of Souls, hitting on threes, re-rolling ones. Reroll that one, three hits. Wounding on twos because of himself, three wounds. Minus one Ren, so three five plus saves, re-rolling ones. Made one, so it's two damage. Uh, that kills a Liberator, but it doesn't matter because this Knight one already had enough models to hold the objective. Yeah. So that is the end of Stormcast's turn three. So the Stormcast take hold of the objective in the middle of this turn and yeah. get two victory points and go up to five. So Knight Haunt turn three. In the Hero Phase, I go up to two command points and then the Guardian of Souls will try to cast Spectral Lure. He needs a six, gets a nine. No, I have no Wizards left. Yeah, he's going to cast it on the Dreadscythe Harridans and bring back six of them, so they're back up to full strength. Yep, so I'll bring back two of the Harridans. So we're on to movement. First off, the Hellwraith will retreat from the Retributors, but he'll bomb them on his way past. So on a five plus, they might take a mortal wound. On a five plus, nope. And the chain guard shuffled over a bit to make sure that the war is extended a bit further. And over here, the blade guys have moved around to actually try and get into the game. So we'll be on to the shooting phase. The chain guards will shoot at this unit of Liberators. So, D3 shots each for four. Hitting on fours, we're rolling ones. Oh, on those ones. Getting three hits this time. Wounding on twos. Getting two. Five plus saves, we're re-rolling one. We roll one. There's six pluses. Oh yeah, the six is actually, but I failed both anyway. Yeah. So we'll take away uh, this Liberator, I think. And then we're on to the charge phase. I'll do these blade guys first. And their charge roll is a six, that might be enough. And the Spirit Torment will charge in as well. So as long as he doesn't get too low. Yeah, neat's enough. Gets him in to there. 
And then over here, the Harridans will charge. Getting a two, so I'll have to spend a command point to re-roll that. Into a ten. So they'll charge into the Liberators over here. That's it for charging. At the start of the combat phase, the Guardian Soldiers are going to stay in combat. We're going to take a risk. But I think I will start with the Spirit Torment. He has three attacks, hitting on fours, rolling ones, getting one hit. Wounds on a three, it does. Mine. Six to save. Oh, I'm rerolling ones. Yep. D3 damage. Two. Kills the Liberator. Normal Liberator will die. I'll do these two Liberators over here. We'll try and fight the Harridans, I suppose, and might get lucky. Five attacks, hitting on three, uh, fours. Ah, eight, two hits. Wounding on threes, two wounds. Two four plus saves. Made on third one. Ignore damage on a six. Does not. I'll just leave this one on the end. Pick the blade guys to go next, see if they can take out that prime. So they can all get in. Eight attacks, re-rolling everything because they're within range of a spirit torment. Rerolling all those ones and twos because we only hit on threes. Getting eight hits. Wounding on threes. Getting six. Then they get an extra attack for charge. Oh yes, they do. So, well, we've got six so far, and then if he's still alive, I'll re-roll the extra four. Uh, no, he's dead. Yeah, even without the extra attacks, that's enough to kill him. And then these units over here. So I'll do the Harrigans first. They are wholly within 12 of the chain gas still, so uh, 13 attacks hitting on fours, re-rolling ones. Re-rolling the ones. Oh, getting three more hits. And again, these are the old Harrigans, so they don't get the extra hits if you roll the six. And they wound on twos, and sixes are two down. Two, two damage and two one damage. Still failing these five plus saves will kill liberators. Three rolling ones. Oh, okay. Oh. Well, alright, the two damage ones go, don't go through. Two more normal saves. Three rolling ones. Oh, wow, we only take one wound from all that. Blimey. So that puts the liberator down to one wound. Yeah, and then the Guardian of Souls gets to go. He has three attacks hitting on threes, rolling ones. He gets two twos as well. So only a single hit wounding on a two. He wounded at least. Five plus save. Oh, wow. Wow, they're still alive. Yeah, well, that's it. No bash rock tests. I did kill three models, so I'll bring back a blade geist. And I will retake the objective in the middle and get four victory points this turn, because I draw all three and I really took one. So I go up to 13. And at the end of battle round three, it's 13 to five. And at that point, I will concede the game. Um, the knight will have one objective over on the far flank that I can't possibly get to with my remaining models, which means that by the end of the game, they would definitely be up to at least 15 victory points, and I can get a maximum of six more by taking these two objectives off them this turn and holding them in my last turn. So I can only get a maximum of 11. So it's yeah. definitely been a knight hunt victory. Uh, certainly a hard fought one, but we'll recap that for you now. So that was the game for issue 65 of Warhammer Age of Sigmar Mortar Arms magazine. How did you think that went? Well, unfortunately not very well. Partly because I made a couple of mistakes, but I think mostly just because a couple of key things didn't go my way. I got very lucky at some key points, I think. Uh, keeping the spirit host alive at one point. Killing uh, the Night Azeroth from full health with the Banshees, that was lucky. And uh, killing Zanja with two mortal wounds from the Hellwraith. Yeah, you also rolled really well to attack the um, Evocators and Draconians mm. with your Harridans. You did make quite a lot of sixes for ignoring wounds and, and the spirit host let me down this game they weren't nearly as indestructible as they usually are yeah the hex race were very indestructible mm. as well you made a lot of saves for them and a lot of sixes to ignore their wounds if the night horse had still been alive he would have been able to use his lantern and do a lot more to wounds to you uh, i didn't quite get in position to use my spirit flask with zandria and she took damage before she could do it anyway so it didn't help yeah i definitely think you would have brought it back if you'd been a little lucky we we're bringing it back yeah i think probably actually the main thing was just losing the roll off for the second turn i'm still not sure if it was the right decision to actually go first myself because it meant that you were able to get six victory points to three up if you'd gone first you would have got three victory points but then i think i would have been unable to take any of them off you in the beginning of turn one simply because my units aren't fast enough you could have sat on the edge of the objective control zones taken them i might be able to get enough models on them to take them back from you possibly but then i think the result would have still been that you would have if you'd still won the roll off for, the, for battle round two you would have just charged all my units with the same effect really i think not getting to use my voctors at all which obviously are one of my highest damage output units and i think actually having the triumph helps because i think i re-rolled quite a few misses into i think yeah i think so and that just let you kill off the last mm. dracoline with a with a hex wraith as well which might not have happened yeah that's effectively two units as well due to the cho way the choices work yes once the retributors got into mellow they did start doing quite a bit of damage but they had a whole turn of not doing anything well they? to be honest and they were very dangerous but they're so slow that i wasn't actually too bothered about the retributors 
I was impressed with my Liberators. They did pretty well. They yeah, made they quite a lot of saves. They consistently rolled six or seven hits. And the Judicators did quite well as well. Unfortunately, they had to shoot the Spirit Hosts all the time. Mm. Yeah, ultimately, I think I just think that my damage output units didn't get to dictate what they were going to do. I think as we've seen recently, on a board this size, I have a speed advantage. I move almost twice as fast as some of your units. Like the Retributors are four inches. You're going to have to pick an objective for them to go for, and they're going to stay there the whole game. And that's a unit that's not going to fight over the other two. It takes a noticeable amount of time for you to get anywhere. I mean, I actually put the Fallen Ruins in the middle of between the two objectives on the right just to make it harder and more annoying for you to get around. The funny thing is the full range of Stormcast are not a slow army. They do actually have quite a lot of cavalry and they also have a allegiance ability they should get which allows them to deploy units anywhere on the board. The Nighthorn get that as well, but the Nighthorn don't have a, so much of a speed problem as the Stormcast in this collection do. I argue with a unit like Retributors, you would actually keep them in reserve so that they can... I think it's called something like Thunderbolt Strike or something like mm-hmm. that as they emerge in a crack of lightning... Because they're so slow that foot yeah. slogging them around isn't practical. Yeah, and it also makes it harder for you losing models as well. You just don't have the numbers to take objectives. Also considering I can bring models back fairly easily. Yeah, and obviously my army selection was deliberately designed with lots of numbers in mind. I had 15 two-wound models and a few bigger ones. And once again, I couldn't take sequitors. Yeah, it does seem weird. And you still only, I don't think you ever get to take all three prosecutors, which is very bizarre. There must be a typo almost. Yeah, I think if I had my choice, I would have taken sequitors and three of octors in this game, both of which have a high damage output and are quite difficult to kill. And the two of octors on Draculines, although they're fast and have a lot of wounds, they still haven't been able to show what they can do. And yeah, because they were a double choice, as it were, you always had more units than I did anyway. Your army was fairly elite and small. You didn't have any unit bigger yeah, than five I mean, models. They, but I mean, if I had chain rafts, I suppose. But if I had taken chain rafts, again, that just makes it even harder for you to uh, get numbers. Although fireball is very deadly against chain rafts. I don't know, the Mimor Banshees didn't actually manage to unbind anything, but they did manage to call out Azeroth, so I can't really complain too much. No. I was tempted to take a Dreadblade to use his teleporting ability, but um, with two heroes, you really need the Dream Team. Oh yeah, and the Realm of Fire rules. Um, well, at least the spell works for me this time. It's not completely useless. Yeah, most of the time it's just a better version of Arcane Bolt against anything more than single models. You can also cast it in addition to Arcane Bolt. And I suppose it's worth noting that with the um, Master of the Black Arts command trait, since that makes the person with it a wizard, if they weren't already, that doesn't mean they can use Firewall as well. I perhaps should have tried to use the command ability when I was making a charge with Zandria. Should have used it on myself, actually, probably just to get the plus one. Uh, it's a bit finicky to use because you have to use it in the hero phase, so you have to plan which unit is going to need and, it. And they have to be wholly within 12 as well. Yeah, so it's not just like the re-roll charges where you can just use it on the spot. You have to think about it. It gives them extra run rolls as well, but that's not going to come up that often. For instance, the run roll would also apply if you used a command point to make a run into a roll into a six, so you get an extra seven inches of movement. That mm. might be far enough to get you on an objective, so you never know. And volcanic, probably more just of a minor annoyance, a bit like the deadly terrain. Like the ruins. Yeah, although it's characterful for the Realm of Fire, in the game it is just irritating because it means you have to think about where your units are going to be in the hero phase. It'd be great if you had a fully modelled sort of volcanic board with lava rivers and hot rocks and things that look like you're in the Realm of Fire, but on a board like this where we've just got generic ruins yeah, and, and I will, things, I will it's say, a bit strange to say that, oh, they're volcanic. Yeah, I will say that it is cool to have all the board, the huge board together, but this has represented the Realm of Life and the Realm of Metal and now the Realm of Fire, so it's all getting a bit samey, I suppose. Well, I will say looking ahead they do give um in the next issue when we get a statue they do give you an alternate painting seem to make you look volcanic so that would fit a bit more and it would make sense on the small realm of fireball you just can't do a game of that size on yeah you just got to use your imagination but i don't think there's too much more to say about this uh game or this issue so as always if you like this content do leave a like and subscribe leave any comments how you've been getting on with mortal realms i know it's been taking us a while but we will finish it might take us a little while as these games get bigger they take longer to film and edit as well which is unfortunate but we've been the table of donkeys and we'll see you in the next one bye for now